in the last two videos we built the communication socket to connect to Loconet. And with the Gateway Library we have a tool for sending Loconet messages to the Wi-Fi network and even to remote locations. Today I am going to add two more libraries for input buttons and analog sensor values and we are ready to build a simple but universal control panel to control switches, signals and more. And in the lab report part I will talk about the various hurdles and small but important technical details I had to deal with to make this work on the ESP32. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So, get on board, the train is leaving the station. If there is one area I always felt the Digitrack system is kind of weak, it is the topic of user input elements. Things like local buttons to activate the switch, set a signal aspect or a knob to control the brightness of a lamp and the like. The only exception I am aware of are the local button inputs of the DS64, but those inputs are limited to control the switch outputs on that particular decoder. Other than that, it is either handheld throttle or computer and the throttle has the limitation that it only can control switch addresses but no NMRA signal aspects and communication of analog sensor values over Loconet is completely unheard of. So I thought let's change that and build a universal button panel that can do all of the above and more. The hardware is really simple. I used the development perf board and soldered a few push buttons to it. One contact of each button is wired to ground, the other contact to an input channel of a 4067 multiplexer. That is the same multiplexer I already used for my picture frame CTC panel. You may want to check video number 10 for details about it. Then I drilled two holes and mounted potentiometers and connected them to the remaining channels of the multiplexer. Of course, I also connected ground and VCC so that I can read an analog value depending on the position of the potentiometer knob. All wiring was done using wire wrap wires, which made it real easy to connect everything to the ESP32 and the multiplexer. I then designed a panel surface using PowerPoint printed it and then laminated it. Next I made two holes for the potentiometer shafts and placed the laminated sheet over the button assembly. I then placed the whole module in a $3 picture frame along with some foam tape to press the laminated sheet to the front of the picture frame. The laminated sheet just sits on top of the push buttons so they can be individually activated. I mounted nice knobs on the potentiometers and closed the picture frame. Then I glued a yellow box to the back with some openings for the wiring and the body of the potentiometers which are slightly sticking out of the picture frame. Inside I placed the multiplexer and an ESP32 board and wired it up. I did not place a Loconet module in the box as I plan to use it without cable, so I only need Wi-Fi and MQTT. Instead, I placed a 3.7 volt battery in the box as power source. That's all. So you get the idea. I want to use this control panel as a wireless device from which I can control switches 1, 2, 3, 4, signal 803, and the brightness of the LEDs of my CTC panel and the signaling system. In addition, I want to have an idle button to stop all trains in an emergency and a go button to restore power to the trains. In order to make the buttons work over Loconet, 
I had to solve two problems which resulted in two new libraries that can be downloaded from my GitHub page. The first problem is reading the status of the buttons and potentiometers and generate button event messages sent over Loconet. And the second problem is listening to those messages and then create action items for them, for example activating a switch or setting a signal aspect. Let me explain the function of each library and how they work together. The process starts with the user pressing a button or turning one of the potentiometer knobs. If this happens, we identify what input line is activated and generate an event. If it is a button, there are five different event types. Button down, button up, button hold, button clicked and button double clicked. Each of these events is sent to Loconet. In the case of an analog input, there is only one event, analog, but with the current analog value as a parameter. On the ESP32, this is a value from 0 to 4095. With the Loconet message format I am using, there can be 4096 different digital buttons and the same number of analog inputs, and both ranges can be quadrupled if necessary. To configure the buttons, I am using a JSON file which is loaded at startup and defines the channel of the multiplexer, the type of button and the button number that should be used. Possible button types are digital, touch sensors and analog inputs. Unused input channels can be set to off and you can also set the type to auto detect so the ESP32 will figure out the input type on the fly. And no, you don't have to worry about writing these configurations manually, you can do it using a web interface as I demonstrated in the CTC panel and signaling system videos. Let me show how this library works. To do it yourself, you first need to download and install the MOOC 64 buttons library in your Arduino IDE. When done, you will have a new example program named Button Input Report. When you open it, you can configure the multiplexer according to the pins used in your wiring. You find more information on this in video 10. You may also want to watch the lab visit part of this video for more information about some nifty details of the ESP32 IO pins. Anyway, when you run the example program and you click on one of the buttons, you will see the event messages showing up precisely with the configured button number. The same is the case when you turn the knob of a potentiometer. As you can see, I did not particularly care when wiring the buttons, I just connected them and used the setup to give each port the button number I wanted it to be. So the ports are in random order, but the button numbers are following a pattern. The only thing you need to make sure is that all button addresses are unique meaning only one button in your Loconet system should have a particular button number. The button event message that is sent over Loconet can now be seen by all the other network participants and one or maybe several nodes may react on the message. Let's say we want to use button 41 to set switch 4 to throne when the button is pressed. So, we have a logic node somewhere that listens for event messages from button 41. As soon as it receives a button down event from button 41, it issues a throne command for switch number 4, which then is received by the command station, which in turn sends a DCC switch command down the track. And the same command message may actually also be used to activate an indicator, for example a position LED for the switch. Sounds complicated? Well, it's not really. It is just how messaging works in an event-based network. In Loconet terms, this is called peer-to-peer -peer networking, with the logic nodes called ALMs, attached logic modules. Computer-to-computer -computer communication in your Ethernet and even in the Internet works essentially the same way. And if you look into open LCB or layout command control or LCC as it is called now by the NMRA, you see the very same concept now named producer consumer model. It is just state of the art as it offers a lot of flexibility. 
Now that we know how it works in principle, let's look into the setup of the button event handler. This again is a JSON string which can be generated using a web interface, but here is how it looks like. Each button handler entry defines the button number it is listening to, followed by a list of the events and a command list for each event. So the first entry here. It is listening for events from button number 11 and in case of a button down event it sends a thrown command for switch number 1, which is DCC address 0 to the command station. That's all we need to define. Further down in the list we see the configuration for signal 803, where we have four buttons, one for each aspect that we send. And at the end of the list we have the power buttons that set the system status to go or idle. Really straightforward and a concept that gives you a lot of flexibility. And keep in mind, thanks to the network structure, it does not matter where the events are being handled. You can handle button events on the same control panel as I do here, or you could handle them on another panel or somewhere else in the network, for example in a Node-RED application somewhere in your local area network. It really does not matter. Let me finish with a quick demonstration. As you have seen, I have four pairs of buttons for switches 1, 2, 3 and 4. The green button issues a closed command, the red button puts the switch to the thrown position. When I click the green button for switch number 3, which is button number 31, this is what happens. A button event is sent from the control panel via MQTT to the MQTT broker. From there, it is broadcasted to all other MQTT nodes. One of them is the gateway that resides inside the CTC panel. From there, the message is injected into Loconet and after successful transmission, relayed back to the MQTT broker and to the control panel where it, is where it is received as incoming message. It is now routed to the button event handler for the button down event of button number 31. The event handler then generates a switch request command and sends it as a new message to the broker. From there it goes to the gateway, is injected into Loconet and reaches the command station. The command station then generates a DCC signal and sends it to the track, from where it finally is received by the DS54 switch decoder and the switch is activated for the closed position. Now I want to set the aspect of signal 803 to track speed, which in my system is aspect value of 10. So I click the track speed aspect button, which is button number 53. The button event message is sent via broker and gateway to Loconet and returns as incoming message to the control panel. It now triggers the event handler, which then generates the aspect command. Well, since Loconet has no message defined for signal aspect commands, we directly generate the command in DCC format using the immediate packet command of Loconet. The message gets out via broker and gateway to the command station, where it is received and inserted into the DCC signal stream. The signaling system then receives the DCC signal and sets signal 803 to green. And finally, a turn on the potentiometer knob. You may have noticed that there is no event handler defined on the control panel for this event. So, what happens here? At first, it is the same. An analog event is generated, sent to Loconet and then received back. But since there is no event handler, nothing happens. But wait, when we look at the CTC panel, we indeed see the brightness of the LEDs on the panel changing according to the potentiometer position. How is that? Well, the event handler for analog input number 15 is not in the control panel, but it is in the CTC panel. And when it receives the analog event message, 
it sets the brightness of the LED chain accordingly. Pretty slick. Now I used the MQTT gateway for this quick demonstration as I wanted to use my control panel via Wi-Fi so that I can walk around with it. But of course I could also have added the Loconet interface hardware to the yellow box and make it communicate directly to Loconet. So MQTT is a feature but not necessary. But if you have watched the last two videos, of course you already know that. So for today, let's summarize. Local control panels with just a few buttons for local switches, signals or other devices are very useful, but unfortunately the support provided by Digitrax for this topic is minimal. Ideally, such buttons provide flexibility and can be configured and combined according to the situation on the layout. To provide this flexibility, I created two separate and independent libraries, one for connecting to the button hardware and the other for the logical handling and the translation of button events to layout commands. And in combination with the communication libraries from the last two videos, building a simple control panel based on a picture frame became a relatively simple project. Of course, the next thing I would like to have is some LED indicators in the control panel to indicate switch positions and signal aspects. If I had that, and since everything is configurable, it then would be a very small step to build a real CTC panel. Well, guess what? We are only one more library away from that to happen. I plan to introduce it in the next video and also walk you through the entire program for the control panel and the CTC panel for that matter, which is the same. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to make sure you will have a premium seat for that show. For now, I hope you found this video helpful or at least interesting. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Okay, I see you're still here. So welcome to today's lab visit and a closer look into the technical aspects of LocoNet buttons and analog messages. At first glance, the GPIO specifications of the ESP32 look very impressive. 32 general IO pins in total. 18 pins with 12-bit analog to digital converter channels. 10 pins with touch capability. Sounds like there should be no problem to do a button module based on this chip. Well, as always, the problems are in the details. And in this case, in some limitations using these pins. First, GPIO 6 to 11 should never be used as IOs because they are used by the system to communicate with the memory. Pins 34 and higher are input only and also do not have an internal pull-up or pull-down resistor. Pins 0 to 3 can only be used with some care as they are used during the boot process of the ESP32. And the real limitation is that only pins that are connected to analog digital converter 1 can be used as analog inputs as soon as Wi-Fi is active. This means when using MQTT we are limited to analog inputs 32 and higher. However, touch input and digital input is not affected by this Wi-Fi limitation. Then it seems there is a mismatch in pin addressing between pin 32 and 33. The touch command is not reading the same pin like the analog or digital read for the same pin number. Strange, but true for all the boards I have looked at. Essentially, if you plan to read the pins by pin number from a loop cycling through the modes, 
you can't use pins 32 and 33. Well, particularly the limitation to ADC1 in case Wi-Fi is used is a real pain as it limits the choices of pins featuring analog input, touch input and digital input to pins 32 and 33. And those are exactly the two pins that have this strange address mismatch. A bummer. Here's how I worked around these limitations. I created a lookup table that encodes the capabilities of each pin. The pin number in the first byte, the ADC number and touch capability in the second. In the read analog function, I then check if Wi-Fi is off or ADC1 is used. If neither is the case, I switch to digital read. So in this case, only analog values 0 and 4095 or returned by the function. This does not mean you can use the pin for a meaningful analog input, but at least it prevents from reading complete garbage. But the real cure of the problem is not found in the library, but in the application. I wired the analog signal of the multiplexer to two different input pins. In my case, pin 15, which has good touch capabilities, and pin 35, which is connected to ADC1. I then defined a total of 32 input ports instead of 16, but in reality they are all coming from the same multiplexer. This is addressed in the configuration by setting half of the ports to off, effectively rerouting the analog inputs to ports 16 and 17, which in the mapping of the library corresponds to multiplexer pins 0 and 1, but received on input 35. In other words, I am reading touch and digital information on input pin 15, while analog inputs are rerouted to input pin 35. A little tricky, but it works quite nicely. Other than that, all results from the research I did in uh, video number 12 are still applicable, even though I was able to simplify the code a little bit. In particular, I reduced the number of consecutive reads from 5 to 2, and the number of burst reads to calculate the rolling average is now down to 5. Overall, this gives me both an effective low-pass filtering of spikes and a fast reaction time when a button is pressed. The second topic I want to cover today is the Loconet message used for button events and analog data. If you have some experience with Loconet messaging, you probably have wondered what message I am using as there is no such thing as an OPC button event message in the Loconet standard. Unfortunately, that is right. And in my opinion, Digitrax has not done a very good job in further developing the Loconet message set to cover nowadays possibilities with advanced sensors and other new technologies. Looking over the Loconet standard, there is exactly one Loconet opcode that has a somewhat open purpose and data structure, and that is the OPC peer transfer message or hex E5. But since this was the only flexible opcode, it has been used over the years by several individuals and even some companies for all kind of different messages. So using it causes a certain risk of running into compatibility problems. To avoid that, I first worked out a suggestion for how to use the peer transfer message for buttons and analog data and published it in the Loconet Hackers News Group. That was about four months ago. I got some very good feedback, a lot of warnings, but also some input from people and even manufacturers who are using the opcode for their own purposes. The most valuable input was from Alex Shepard, who pointed me to the SV programming message format, which really is a Digitrax approved extension to the Loconet PE standard, reserving an entire subgroup of the peer transfer message for the purpose of Loconet based device configuration. 
He suggested using one subgroup of this message format for the purpose of sending button events and analog data. So I reviewed my original su suggestion and defined my messages which are now a subgroup of the SV messaging format. Here is the message structure in detail. P510 is the peer transfer opcode as defined by Digitrex. Source is the sender address. It really is meaningless as Loconet devices normally do not carry a unique ID. It just must be from 1 to hex 6f as higher numbers are reserved by Digitrex for their own devices. SV command must be hex 71. This is the group that Alex suggested to use for my proposed message range. SV type must be hex 02 as this is the Digitrex approved SV command range. SVX1 has two bits for additional address banks of 4000 addresses which is for future extensions. Right now it is all zeros. Destination high and low is always zero. This is the only change to current practices in SV messaging as SV explicitly does not know broadcast messages which makes sense if you want to do device configuration. To distribute status information of course broadcasting is the way to go. So that is why in SV command 71 these bytes always are zero. SV address low and high have a total of 12 bits device address allowing for a total of 4096 buttons and 4096 analog sensors and if needed these numbers can be quadrupled by using the address bank selectors in SVX1. I guess that number of buttons and sensors should be sufficient even for larger layouts. SVX2 is currently not used so it always should be set to hex 10. D1 is the device type. 0 is for 12 bit analog sensors, 1 is for buttons. The remaining 253 possible device types are for future extensions. Data low and data high is 12 bit sensor data for analog sensors or the event type for buttons. And D3, D4 are additional data bytes that are not used at this time. So with this definition, I think we have a message format that does the trick and has plenty of reserve for future extensions and innovation. I have been communicating with Alex who is kind of the appointee for the SV protocol over the past few weeks and he is adding it to the SV protocol document with status pending approval. So if you have any comments or change requests or see any problems please let us know by commenting on this video or even better posting in the Loconet Hackers messaging group on groups.io. Okay, that's it from the lab for today. I hope this was not too boring for you, but since you are still here, I assume it was not. Thanks for watching and see you next time.